Good morning, everybody. As you come in, um, welcome to the webinar. Um, So we, why don't we go ahead and go into the um, Zoom, uh, Brady Bunch mode? Great, thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm just letting everyone sort of come in. We have many of you on the line. Thank you for joining us this morning. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I am Laura Singer. Um, I am a facilitator. I'm working with Consensus Building Institute. And we are uh, working with the state of Maine as they um, do a lot of work, uh, as you've seen, about floating offshore wind. Um, and so I'm here to help facilitate the conversation. If um, we have Zoe Miller, who is a technical person, uh, and if there's some technical issue that comes up, uh, you can chat with her directly um, and, and we can try to make sure we get that resolved. I know we have people that are on via video and probably on via phone as well. Um, if, um, <clears throat> if you could um, go ahead, Zoe, and put up the first slide that we have, that would be terrific. And then on to the next one. Um, I just want to do a few Zoom reminders and then we'll have um, Selena Cunningham give us just a little bit of a, of a welcome. But before that, um, for everyone, uh, please, I know many of you have been on many of these Zoom conversations at this point. I think we're, I was noting that we're reaching almost a year um, for many of us having been in the COVID world, um, but please uh, mute yourself. We have this as an open um, meeting so that people can ha have an open Q and A, um, but that requires us to mute ourselves. If you're on the phone, press star six um, to mute and unmute. You automatically unmute. Um, the raise your hand button is the is the is the blue button. Um, that's helpful for us. Um, if you, then you can see your hand, or if you. If you try to wave, there are so many people that it might be difficult for me to see you. So if you use the raise hand function, if you're on the phone, it's a star nine to raise your hand when we get to the Q&A. Um, so we will have Q and, uh, plenty of time for Q&A in our discussion this morning. Um, we welcome both comments and questions. Uh, I'll ask everyone obviously to share the floor so that a lot of different questions can be asked. Um, uh, and that um, this is an opportunity for us to continue to learn, all of us, um, as we begin to understand what um, offshore wind might look like in the Gulf of Maine and what the technology might look like and um, welcome all sorts of different conversations. Those questions that we can't answer now, we'll try to make sure we um, find answers to them or have other opportunities to have additional webinars um, to provide those um, answers for all of us to learn. On that note, um, we had originally planned to get into both floating technology and cabling in this conversation. And we've decided to keep the conversation float, um, focused um, due to time on just the floating technology aspects of it. So um, for our agenda, we'll have Walt Musel, who's from uh, the principal engineer and lead for offshore research from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory gave us a presentation and he'll speak for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. We are gonna have a more in-depth cabling conversation um, and bring in some uh, additional experts to have that conversation. We're gonna plan that for a future date. Um, so without, uh, without further ado, I will turn this over to Selena. Selena Cunningham, who is the Deputy Director of the Governor's Energy Office. And I think we take the next slide, Sully. Thanks, Laura. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. It's really exciting to see 
so many people continue to, to uh, listen in to our um, conversations on offshore wind as we continue um, our efforts here in the state. I just wanna take a minute before we delve into the important conversation on the floating technology with Walt to first provide a little bit of context about um, how what we are doing in, here in the state re in regards to uh, clean energy in, in offshore wind and, and a little bit of context. So um, in 2019, the governor and the uh, signed legislation uh, putting in place a number of uh, important um, bills to um, advance our renewable energy um, requirements in the state and also put in place some of the most um, ambitious climate um, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements in, in the country. And so since then, a variety of stakeholders have been working on um, in implementation plans about how to go about meeting our ambitious climate agenda. And one piece of that is our renewable energy uh, needs. Next slide. So in terms of renewable energy, as we look to electrify our um, transportation and home heating and other uh, types of uh, fossil fuels in our, in our energy system, we'll need more electricity and we need, we'll need more clean energy um, resources. Offshore wind is one piece of that puzzle in addition to onshore wind, solar, batteries, and other um, uh, renewable energy. So uh, we, the governor's energy office just, I believe last week released a report, a renewable um, portfolio standard, um, an energy assessment about how to best meet our energy, renewable energy needs over the next decade. And it outlined that over, um, that offshore wind is a part of that long-term um, vision. And so the reason for that is that Maine has some of the most uh, abundant, strong, consistent winds in, in deep waters off our, our coast. Um, and so we, we want to, it lends itself to, to um, advancing offshore wind. And in addition to that, um, we, we see an a important opportunity to ad advance a, an additive economic sector into our, um, into our state that we see as, a, as an important addition. And lastly, I'd say that uh, University of Maine is on the forefront of floating technology innovation and has been doing work for over a decade that is putting the state in a, in a good position in terms of technology. So next slide. So as we think about how we want to pursue offshore wind, uh, we are, are working to take a, a, a measured and deliberate approach to advancing offshore wind. We've been doing work for well over a decade here in the state and, and, and this is a long-term plan in terms of how we're going to bring off, how we plan to bring offshore wind to Maine. We know that there is a lot of, um, uh, information and questions and, and opportunities that we need to explore as a state and as stakeholders and as citizens. And we wanna um, create an a, a, a forum in which people can get information and we can answer questions that people have. We also are going to be working with our regional partners and, um, and, and experts who have been working on, on this for a long time. And the Gulf of Maine is obviously a, a shared, um, shared uh, asset that we all wanna uh, be sure that we're co coordinating on. So we're doing that and then we really are um, listening and adapting to um, our, our kind of approach as we work with stakeholders. Next slide. So how we're doing this is the, the state has an offshore wind initiative to pursue uh, strategic opportunities for advancing offshore wind. Uh, we want to do this with uh, maximizing compat compatibility with existing ocean users and uh, uh, one of the most important being the fishing industry, recognizing the importance from a cultural and economic standpoint, want to uh, find ways to uh, coexist and minimize any impacts to um, uh, existing activities. We are, uh, from a planning perspective, um, embarking on the development of a, a comprehensive roadmap that will outline strategic opportunities for the state to pursue across a variety of different fields. When you look at our ports um, and infrastructure, what assets do we have now? What should we consider for the future? Um, what, um, what's the state of our supply chain and how it can support um, in our workforce, how it can support the existing offshore wind industry that is, is um, growing in the US and then how it can support a, a future uh, opportunities as well. And so in this later this spring, we'll stand up a stakeholder process that will delve into um, reviewing um, our opportunities here and, and doing some technical work around, around the potential 
and the challenges that we'll face as we pursue offshore wind. And so you'll hear more from us on that, but I wanted to make sure that people um, knew that that was happening and that we'll, those conversations will be open to the public. And so we really um, would value your engagement on those. Next slide. Um, so in so in addition to uh, the, the process, we have a number of projects that we are, um, in terms of the projects, we're pursuing a phased approach to, to development here in the state. Um, and we have the uh, uh, New England, I'm sorry, University of Maine is, is planning a one um, uh, uh, turbine project off of uh, Monhegan Island. In addition to that, the state is pursuing a, um, uh, what we're calling a offshore wind floating off, uh, research array that is planned. Um, we're in the early stages of planning that. It will be a project that will be in federal waters. It'll be um, 12 turbines or fewer. And we're uh, looking at uh, identifying a site and working with stakeholders to do that. Um, that will be 16 squ square miles or, or smaller. We have not yet identified a specific site. Next slide. So this just shows you the, the phased approach to our planning here. We have the, uh, the um, 2013 uh, feasibility one eighth scale pilot project from the University of Maine, um, and the one turbine project I mentioned that's that's on on track for 2023, um, and then the research array is we're in the early stages, but we hope to have something in the water by 2025. Um, there's more information on our on our website that goes into um, ongoing stakeholder conversations we're having around planning, in addition to FAQs and other information there. So I encourage you to to check that out. And then lastly. We're continuing to partner, um, to work with the federal and regional uh, partners on this, on this task force that's looking at large scale commercial offshore wind in federal waters that's managed by the federal government. We are early in those conversations. There not, is not a specific timeline for those, those, those um, future steps, but it is an ongoing conversation that we will participate in in order to, um, a, as we look longer term towards long, larger projects in the Gulf of Maine. Next slide. And with that, I, I, um, I'm happy to uh, feel free to reach out if you have additional questions about our, either our planning or the project that the state is working on. And I look forward to the conversation today. Back to you, Laura. Great, thank you so much, Selena. Um, I, I, that was a great introduction. And um, now I think, uh, Zoe, we can go right into uh, Walt Musel, as I mentioned. He leads the offshore wind research um, platform at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And he's been there for 32 years. Um, if you have uh, access to the chat, Stephanie just put in his bio and we also had it on the website as part of the agenda. So without further ado, um, Walt, thank you so much for jo uh, joining us from Colorado. Thank you. I, I'd like to um, start by thanking uh, Selena and Stephanie and Laura for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, can, can I uh, get you to put up the first slide just to make sure we're, we're all, the technology's working, Zoe? Yes. So Zoe's going to be uh, flipping slides for me. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Habib Dagger and the great work that they're doing at the University of Maine. I, I've been working with Habib since 2008. When I first came to Maine, uh, there was a, a an event at the uh, sponsored by the main uh, UMaine Law School, and we we met and started talking then about uh, the potential for offshore wind in in Maine, and it's great to look out and, and just see some familiar faces and people I've been working with for for a decade. Uh, I see uh, Chris Wisman and Stan White um, part of the project now, so um, I'm going to talk today about the. Uh, potential for floating wind in, uh, in the US, the world, and, and hopefully in Maine. I don't see the slides, um, Zoe. Um, so I'm not, um, I don't right, know if I'm I just trying to get it in the right view. Okay. I'm gonna give you a minute to, to do that. Thank you. But um, so, so this has been, this is really um, a great opportunity for, for Maine and uh, and I'm and I appreciate being part of this right now. It's a, it's um it's great to see that the the state has um it, it is advancing and evolving toward uh, 
renewable energy goals and targets that um, involve offshore wind. And um, so my, um, my presentation today will talk about the um, um, somewhat about the technology, about the deployment so far, and um, are you seeing okay. the right uh, view here? I'm I'm seeing my bio, which I'm not going to spend any time on. I think okay. I've been introduced already, but I put it into the presentation because I um I really um just want in case people want to uh, go back and see that. Um, is there any way you can uh, make that larger? Uh, there we there are. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Or right. do you need to go back a slide? Uh, no, I'm good. So this right. is this is good. Let's start here. Um, so the first thing I want to do is talk about the technology. Um, all of this started um, from basically there's two tra uh, trajectories, two converging paths. The um, the technology for offshore wind evolved from land-based wind, obviously. But um, so wind turbines were developed on land, and then they evolved to offshore, and they were most of the foundations that you see. Um, 99% of them have been installed uh, using fixed bottom uh, foundation technology, which means the substructure for the tower connects directly to the seabed. What you're seeing in this, um, th this di um, diagram on the, on the right is a description of the floating technology. So floating technology is a um, derivative of, of, of this fixed bottom technology, but the foundations have um, a buoyancy and they float in the ocean and they're moored and tethered to the, to the bottom of the sea. That allows the sites to be in much deeper water. And uh, it, frankly, it gives us a lot more options in terms of where we can put the wind turbines. We can put them further from shore and, uh, and in, in better wind regimes. There are basically uh, three different types of foundations that I'm showing you here. And um, most, well, all of these were derived from oil and gas technology. So they've been doing floating foundations in the oil and gas industry for decades. And there are um, three basic archetypes. Um, and all of the foundations that we see are based on this. And it has to do with how each of these systems get their static stability when they're floating in the water. So a spar, which is shown on the left, is a deep draft uh, floating system. It's got buoyancy on the top and a lot of ballast on the on the bottom, and it's tethered with these uh, kind of slack uh, catenary mooring lines. The challenges, though, when these are that the draft is very deep, and so it's um, difficult to tow these structures in and out of uh, standard port facilities. And by deep, I mean 70 to 100 meters deep, um, too deep for most of the channels that exist today. But they did put the, one of the first commercial pilot projects was put in uh, uh, Scotland uh, about three years ago uh, by Equinor and using these spar technologies. But the technologies they used to tow them across the, uh, the North Sea from Norway and, and get um, to the sites in uh, Peterhead, Scotland, um, probably are not um, adaptable or sustainable for some of the technologies today. So we have to go to something that's a little bit more shallower in draft. And the semi-submersible, which is the second one shown in the middle, is um, achieves that um, static stability by distributing its buoyancy on the surface. So it has a shallower draft and it's easier for uh, uh, companies to use this to, to support their wind turbine. It's also uh, supported by or moored and tethered by these slack catenary mooring lines. Um, but uh, it's easier to, it overcomes a lot of the assembly problems. So you can do bring a lot of the labor into uh, port and, and get it done in a, in a more using cheaper uh, methods and more efficient methods. Uh, but the, there is some uh, challenges. There's a, a much higher exposure to waves because there's a lot of uh, steel or concrete in this case of Aquaventus on the surface and the structure, uh, and there's more structure above the waterline so it's heavier. Um, the tension leg platform is the one on the far right and that has the challenge of be, that it's unstable when it's being assembled typically. And it has to be, the buoyancy has to be pulled down by these uh, tension legs that um, pr provide the stability. Uh, but th that um, those overturning moments can be overcome by hybrid systems that um, allow that 
um, platform to float on the top without uh, tipping over. And so those are being worked on. And the advantage of the tension leg platform is that there's a smaller footprint of the anchor uh, system, um, but it, it has these very high vertical load moorings, about um, at least 10 times higher loads on those and the, and the, the pull force is upward. So it's a much more challenging system to, um, to um, develop and install. So those are the kind of archetypes that have been, oh, in the next slide, um, I forgot I don't have control. So there's been a lot of, um, the first phase of, of floating technology involves a lot of different prototypes. And um, these are, a lot of these have not, not even been put in yet. A lot of them have, I'm not going to go through each one and what they've done, but um, because there's just not enough time to do that. But all of these designs combine elements from the, the three archetypes that I just showed you. And um, the, they're addressing it through hybridization, the um, challenges that are um, with, with each of these systems. So with the semi-submersible, we need to look at uh, corrosion at the, at the surface and, uh, and stability to make sure that it works. And you see in the, the third one over from the, from the left is the uh, Aqua Ventus uh, technology that's being developed at the University of Maine. Um, next slide. And this is just a close up of, of that uh, technology. It's, it's a novel technology that was developed under the Advanced Technology Demonstration Program that was sponsored by the Department of Energy um, a few years back. Uh, this uh, technology though has advanced pretty far because it did have that um, government support. And, uh, and this, uh, this project is, a, as I think it was mentioned at the, for, beginning by Selena, that, that, it, that it's going forward uh, at a site um, off the coast of Monhegan Island uh, at a scale of about uh, 10 to 12 megawatts. It's, um, it's being looked at right now. Um, and in the final phases, it's in the, and the partnership was solidified when, when uh, RWE and, and um, Diamond Energy, Offshore Energy joined those, uh, that, that consortium of, of um, investors to um, to make this project whole. So uh, we expect to see this um, under uh, construction soon and uh, with still the expected date of uh, 2023 uh, to be deployed. This would be, this is significant because it's the first, it would be the first floating full scale wind turbine in the United States. And looking at the, the resources that's going, that are going into uh, offshore technology, this would give the United States a, a, a big leg up in terms of its um, potential for manufacturing these substructures and assembling the turbines and, and being a leader in uh, floating technology in general, which could rival in, in volume the, uh, the technology for fixed bottom systems uh, because there's plenty of sites. Could I have the next slide? So this is kind of where we stand today. If you look at the technologies, anything below 60 meters in depth is really fixed bottom. And that's where the vast majority of foundations have. And I've given you some numbers. These are from last year, but this is, these are the countries that are leading it. Um, fixed bottom technology is, um, is prevalent. It's 99%, as I said. There's only been uh, 84 megawatts of installed capacity for floating and that's, um, that I kind of described in the earlier, I have, a, I have more on that. So could I have the next slide? So I'm just um, bringing up the banner that's basically saying that floating has the potential to surpass um, fixed bottom technology once, the, once it's matured because 80% of the resources globally are in areas where floating would be better or probably um, more suitable. And it's, and as I've said, this enables sites that are further from shore, out of sight and better winds. And, um, and I, in, in the case of Maine, we really need to go into uh, floating technologies because the shallow water sites are too close to shore. So everything's gonna be further out. And that's been the, the kind of the topic um, of, of the whole um, technology discussion for, for the last decade. And it's starting to, to come to fruition. We expect to see 
uh, commercial floating wind turbine projects uh, deployed worldwide by 2024. And I'm not counting the Aquaventus project, I'm talking about large scale uh, developments that are going on in Korea and Asia and places like that, that where we'll see um, uh, kind of a, a a, a, a sharp rise in deployments. Uh, and some of these ovals just kind of circle the parts of the globe where, where this is being considered. Next slide, please. So this is the way we show our the pipeline. And we do, one of the things we do is to collect uh, data, market data from various places and, and then uh, consolidate it and, and publish it so we can get a view of what's happening. We do this every year. This is from uh, basically up to data up to the end of 2019. So it's a year old data, but the pipeline for offshore wind floating is um, approaching eight gigawatts. So it's a, it's a big, that's a much bigger number than the 84 megawatts that have been installed. So there's a wave of, of new floating technology that's coming. There's about 1500 megawatts that's already been permitted. It's in develop, the development phase. Next slide, please. And this is just uh, kind of showing the, uh, how the, the first 84 gigawatts had, has been installed. It started out by, uh, the development of about six to eight uh, prototypes that we just put in single turbines. A lot of them were smaller, two, me two megawatt size. And that's the first kind of flat part of this curve. But then uh, Japan started putting projects in, uh, in the kind of the mid, of, mid to the last decade. And then the first <coughs> um, commercial floating project was the uh, Equinor project that went to Peterhead. And that's that kind of um, bluish, uh, piece that goes up. And then uh, most recently, the uh, wind float Atlantic went in by uh, principal power in, in Portugal. So you see the, the, the curve starting to grow, but it's still only 84 megawatts. Next slide. <clears throat> um, in the future, this is what, what, we're, what we're looking at right now. And this is uh, near-term stuff that's coming up soon. There's going to be a, a knee in the curve as, as new projects start to get put in. There's about 14 projects in, in Europe that are in the pilot scale phase, and it'll introduce a lot of the new technologies that we're, we're still looking at. It's a, it's a nascent industry, but there's going to be some commercialization that starts around 2024. And you can see that in this um, projection that's coming in. This is, this is real data from projects that are actually being uh, proposed, planned, uh, permitted, and built. Next slide, please. So, of those projects, of the ones that are announcing what they're doing, um, this shows you the types of substructures. Going back to that very first um, slide that I showed you, the semi-submersible is by far the uh, most popular, most common, most um, pr proposed type of substructure. And we think that's because the, um, it's the easiest to uh, deploy from a, a standard port facility. But there are many hybrid versions of that semi-submersible. And there are some that uh, we're looking at that are that have the uh, um, both the capabilities of the semi-submersible and the um, smaller uh, footprints of the tension leg platform. These are uh, uh, concepts that need to be adapted still. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, next slide, please. Here's a, um, a map of the United States, obviously that um, is divided into uh, two color bands. One's the where fixed bottom technology would probably be the most suitable. And then there's uh, a darker uh, navy blue band that shows you where floating technology might be more suitable. And the, the areas that we're focusing on in the industry are, are these lighter um, aqua bands. Um, that's where a lot of the, the near-term development is happening, but you can see that the, the area for floating is, is actually larger. It's the West Coast, it's the it's other places in, in the East Coast, including Maine. Um, so this, I'm gonna just click through some of these regionalities. Um, go ahead and click the, do the first click here. And there's the Pacific region where we're looking at very high water depths, really no potential for, for anything but floating. And so a lot of the technology that's being developed is targeted at these areas, uh, including uh, Oahu in Hawaii. Next one, uh, next click. Uh, 
is the uh, North Atlantic. Um, people say, well, why do we need it in the North Atlantic? We already have so much going in, but uh, I've, we've already said, you know, Maine is, is uh, unique. It, it, it needs, the Gulf of Maine is, is deep and it needs floating technology. But um, also in, in areas of the Northeast where they're expanding beyond where the current lease areas are, we're going to need more sites. We're, and there's uh, a competition in um, competing uses for fishing and other things with, that might um, lend itself better to floating technologies that can be sited um, in other places. So we're, we're probably gonna need uh, floating sites in, in the Northeast, uh, not just in Maine. And uh, one more click is uh, the Great Lakes, which is some, a future technology, but uh, in um, the Great Lakes, tend to be deeper in, especially if we want to get out of sight and, uh, and floating technology may play very well there. Okay, so next slide. I'm just gonna uh, focus in on uh, a little bit more on the, uh, the Atlantic states. And these bar, this bar chart shows you by state uh, and in reduced order the, um, the amount of resource that's available in each of these states. And you can see Massachusetts has, has the most. And um, uh, pay attention to the colors. The, the, the pinkish reddish colors means it's, it's in water depth that's shallow and can be uh, fixed to the bottom. The darker blue colors are, are floating uh, areas and in very kind of light shaded gray are the, are the very deep areas. Um, you can see that Maine has the best uh, resource for floating technology other than uh, Massachusetts, which just has a, a large coastal region. Um, so, uh, and, and the good news also is that that resource is in fairly, not really deep, it's in the 200 uh, meter range. So this, it lends itself well to, um, to the technology that's been proven in Europe. Uh, so there's a lot of resource in floating. If you take away the, the, the stuff that's uh, zero to 10 nautical miles from shore, there's about 68% of the Atlantic resources is in deep water. So it's, it's uh, uh, almost three quarters seven, uh, of the resource is gonna be in uh, deeper waters. Next slide, please. So this is, um, the picture is, was drawn really for um, Hawaii, um, but you can see some of the stuff that's under the water. Um, I'm going to talk. I'm going to go through a lot of the uh, balance of system, which is basically everything that's non-turbine equipment: um, the floating substructures, the array cables, the, the mooring system, installation and assembly ports that I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, substations, export cables, and then uh, the life is life expectancy is, is keeps getting increasing as we get more confident, but decommissioning after 25 to 30 years maybe, or repurposing. So we'll see, uh, but so about 75% of the cost comes in these, um, this balance of system. Uh, so um, next slide. The cables are um, different in floating system because they have to be dynamic. So we have these lazy wave kind of uh, droopy uh, electrical cables that uh, they're, they're actually very, uh, tight systems there and very thick. Uh, so there's very little danger that a whale is going to get tangled up in them because they just don't twist that easy. It takes a lot to, to move these cables and, and they're very, very big, but they um, eventually have to be uh, landed into a, a, and trenched into a system like this. Um, so um, one of the challenges of the industry is to develop the, these reliable uh, systems for dynamic uh, motion. To, to so the platform's moving up and down and the cable eventually has to find a, a stable place on, in the seabed. Uh, next slide, please. The, um, this is a sketch of, a, of, a, of the mooring system. These are the catenary mooring systems that um, come down. The way the catenary mooring systems work is, is there's usually a length of a heavy chain that um, uh, pulls the, the whole system down. This, these chains can be um, very heavy and again, very difficult but because they're under uh, 50,000 pounds of load, they're not gonna um, be, be slack enough to tangle up a, a whale, but there could be um, debris or rogue uh, fishing uh, gear that gets um, 
caught in, on one of them. And, and we're very aware of that and very um, conscious of the fact that we need to um, prepare for those kinds of entanglements. And, and so there'll be monitoring systems to look for that. Um, but the catenary mooring systems have a fairly wide footprint and um, they use these drag embedment anchors because they have to have um, the, the anchors have to be horizontally loaded so the um, the transition from these from the vertical uplift forces in the um, in the mooring lines to these horizontal forces require that the mooring lines are probably at least four times longer than the water depth at, at any given point um, and you see there uh, there's Marco in the picture with a one of the synthetic mooring lines just to show kind of a, a scale of how big they are the big it's big rope um, next slide this is a, a, a view that I, or a slide I got from uh, University of Maine, Anthony Vaselli, uh, is, and, and we're, we're actually working with them on this. There's a, 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 a movement or a kind of a, 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 a research program that we're looking at to um, develop uh, synth, um, mooring line systems that are semi-taught which would require, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly big design change that has to happen. It's not a simply a, a, a choice that you'd make to, to make a, a, a taut mooring. It, it, it changes the design of the whole system. But if, if we can uh, look at this and, and determine how to do it, it can reduce this um, anchor circle by a factor of two. And you can see the two, the comparison between the traditional chain mooring line radius, which is the purple circle and the green circle, which shows the, um, the, the taut mooring uh, circle that, that might be possible uh, and might help um, relieve some of the issues with, um, with fishing and the impacts that, that it might have on fishing by taking up more of the seabed. So there's a reduction in that mooring line length by a, by a half uh, under the re current research program that we're working on. And the, stay tuned for more of that, but um, that's, that's just getting underway right now. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, this is a, this really talks about the requirements for for harbors and the infrastructure required to assemble and deploy these machines. So you, we would need a permanent port uh, port facility that that allows the assembly of the floating substructures and the service of those substructures. Uh, so you need a, a wharf space. You need um, uh, navigation channel that's deep enough and wide enough to be able to pull the, the, the substructures fully assembled in and out so there can't be um, low bridges and things like that, or probably any bridges. Um, the, the, you need the upland yard for assembly and lay down uh, cranes that have to have the capacity of, to lift the entire turbine, and then um, crew and access for, for the maintenance. And so the, the, the next slide, the uh, um, I have one more after this, but the, these, this is showing the substations uh, and there will be for the larger systems there will be a substation. Uh, floating substations is a, is a unique challenge. This is a fixed bottom uh, substation that's shown for the London array. They'll look uh, a lot like this, except they'll be floating and they'll have uh, dynamic high voltage cables that go to them. Some people are looking at uh, putting the substation on the bottom to avoid uh, the dynamic cable situation so that that uh, is, is very experimental and we'll see how that moves uh, next slide uh, I, I just wanted to come back to that uh, operation maintenance uh, point because in a fixed bottom system you have to have the, the heavy lift vessel for major repairs to come out and lift components up and down uh, at sea in the um, Theoretically, in the in the floating operations and maintenance, we'll be um, servicing the the, the um, turbines, like you see on the on the left with a service boat or major repairs. You can bring the, the turbine, uh, un unhook it from the mooring lines and tow it in to be serviced into the same port where it was assembled, or a different port depending on how how we're set up. So these are um, things that we're looking at. It means jobs uh, that are sustained. Uh, not just for the construction phase, but also for during the uh, operation and maintenance phase in perpetuity. So um, next slide. And I just want to kind of finish with um, kind of one of the technology directions. And uh, there's a lot more to talk about, but, um, but I think 
uh, what's going on in, in a lot of people's minds is we're trying to um, develop technology that um, we can use to uh, support these larger turbines. And the, these um, j just in the last couple of years, <clears throat> we've seen um, a, a new um, 12 to 15 megawatt platform emerge from the industry. This was anticipated, but most of these machines don't exist yet. They're, um, they're or, or the GE machine has been built and prototyped in Rotterdam, but um, the industry is relying on these larger machines, which means bigger machines, taller machines will, um, they'll, um, but, but the industry will need fewer machines to uh, accomplish its, its goals. And uh, just to run through these, General Electric has the 12 megawatt Halyard X, it's um it's also already proposed uh, versions that are 13 and 14 megawatts in size. The Siemens Gamesa just announced their 14 megawatt uh, 222 rotor diameter, and uh, and then the Vestas just a couple of weeks ago announced the um, the 15 megawatt Vestas machine. And we we've seen from the industry this is not a, a new trend. The industry has been growing, and the prototypes take several years to get from prototype phase to um, commercial production. But once they they do, they become the, the industry, and the old platforms uh, are. Are no longer um, competitive because larger machines cost less. Um, it, it co larger machines lower the cost per kilowatt hour of, of offshore wind energy. So the larger the machine, the, the lower the, um, the, the cost will be to the consumers. And that's that's been the general trend all along. It also, um, it, it's very subjective, but larger machines tend to um, be more visually appealing because there's fewer of them and it looks less cluttered on the on the horizon when you're looking at them. So, um, but that, that's obviously uh, uh, not uh, decided by everybody. Uh, okay, next, next slide. I just wanna wrap up. Um, the key takeaways, 80% yeah, um, of the global resources are in areas where floating technology is gonna be uh, uh, best suited. And the first commercial development for floating systems are already being developed in uh, Asian countries, uh, namely Korea. And we expect to see those coming on around uh, 2024. This um, technology is still developing though. And uh, uh, the stuff you, we're, that's going in right now may not be the stuff that's going in 10 years from now, but the University of Maine project uh, is leading in, in a lot of that technology. And I think we'll see that um, it, it, it becoming uh, one of the feasible designs for um, expansion into the commercial phase of, of floating technology. Um, these the costs of floating. I'm often asked, um, are and I didn't show costs in, in this presentation, but the cost for floating. There's absolutely no reason why. Uh, floating has to be more expensive. In fact, there's a lot of reasons why floating could be cheaper than. Uh, than fixed bottom technology because we can bring a lot of the labor into the, the port where it's easier to do and, and cheaper. And um, well, that's yet to be proven, but, um, but there's um, no reason why we, we shouldn't see this um, favorable economics for floating systems. The turbine size is gonna be a big challenge to, um, to, to match that with substructures that can be put out there, but that's, uh, we're doing it and um, we're looking at probable spacing of one nautical mile thereabouts and um, designers are um, you know circling back to the fishing industry the designers are looking at mooring systems that can minimize the anchor and mooring footprints on the seabeds to um, to minimize the entanglement hazards and, and minimize the conflicts that might arise with fishing and i'm um, i'm going to stop there and um, take questions i'm sure i probably went over Thank you, Walt. Um, much appreciated. There was a lot in that, um, and that was that was really terrific. Um, I wanted just to point out to people joined us a little bit later that we had originally planned on having um, both a floating technology and a cabling conversation. And given the strong interest in the topic of cables, we wanted to provide a more in-depth conversation um, and have time that we didn't have today to get um, into that topic. So we're only focusing on this floating technology presentation, which was which was wonderful, Walt, and really, I think, gave a lot of people an opportunity to understand
understand more um, and, be, and I'm sure also raise a lot of questions. Um, so we have um, some plenty of time here for some Q&A and I would ask people, I also see that people are already um, putting some questions in the, uh, in the chat and would uh, and ask people also to use their raise hand and I'll do my best um, to try to get to everybody and um, would ask Stephanie to also if you could keep an eye out and help me as well um, uh, to make sure we get as many questions as we can addressed. And I know Stephanie, for those people that can see it, is putting online um, some more information um, as questions arise. And she just put in, there was a recent um, uh, series about transmission and, and quite a bit um, that the uh, Northeast Regional Ocean Council did and the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Council. So um, there is some information there that might be useful for people. And again, we will have a more in-depth conversation about cables in a future webinar. So I see John Archer um, and then Nick Lund, and then I'll go to a question in the chat. So um, John, we can unmute you and um, go ahead and ask your question. John, are you there? Still muted, John. Do you know how to do that? Um, there you go. Okay, great. Here we go. Okay. Yes. I, um, I just read recently that uh, Vestas, uh, I think out of Denmark, has um, invested in the company that builds wooden towers. And I wondered if, um, because they're so much lighter, they're claiming they could put big wind generators, big ones, as big as 10 megawatts. Would that help out the situation? And what terms of corrosion would would be better uh, uh, than metal or would it be worse? And do you have any opinions on that? Yeah, I mean, I heard about this last week, so I haven't really had time to form an opinion, but I, um, I have a lot of experience with wooden blades. Uh, they don't really make wooden blades anymore because uh, they didn't do very well scaling up to the sizes that we have right now. And they were using uh, more old growth timber. Um, I think that, that, that the old growth problem can be resolved by um, harvesting uh, second growth uh, timber. And I know that um, the, the, I don't know the answers yet, but the questions that I would have about wooden, you know, can we make it lighter? Um, certainly avoiding corrosion would be one of the main objectives. And if we could make it lighter and, and avoid the corrosion, I think there might be a market for it if we could make the, if it could come in and cost and, and cost the right amount. So, and, and of course that's something that might be indigenous to, um, to Maine because um, there's a big timber industry and uh, there's a, a lot of technology that's already been developed here for, um, for building wooden structures. So um, we'll keep an eye on that. Great question. Um, Nick Lund, and then we'll go to some of the um, chat questions I'm getting. Nick, if you want to- Hi there, can you, guys, can you guys hear me? We can. All right, hey, uh, thanks Walt for that great presentation. Um, I have a question and I don't know if this is more of a cabling question, but it's about what you mentioned about rogue fishing gear or other material yep. in the water getting tangled. Can you maybe talk about that more and um, sort of if they're if you're aware of the scope of the potential issue there and how that stuff is removed and then what the you know how much it might take to affect you know integrity of the cables or of the turbines themselves or yeah um so this is a new industry so we don't have any experience yet with th this problem um, we are, are anticipating that it might be a problem so we want to get ahead of it um the uh, the idea is that these these mooring lines are very solid. Uh, they're not they're not going anywhere. They don't t tangle up or twist. But um, something drifting in the um, in the water column could get caught, and then that could create uh, a net or a or a, a way to uh, entangle uh, a mammal or or some uh, or other uh, animals that are down there. So um, I, I I think. Uh, but that has to be monitored fairly carefully, and, and uh, the, the debris, if, if it gets caught on the mooring lines, needs to be cleared. So I think they'll. Um, this is crystal ball kind of stuff, but I think um, we will see uh, inspection techniques and remote monitoring of those cables that would allow um, 
uh, an operator to know if there was uh, debris on the cable and they could send something out to, to clear it. Um, there are ROVs that, that are um, probably would need to be adapted um, to um, clear debris off of cables. And we may need to do that anyway, um, because marine growth can accumulate on the cables and cause additional loading and um, un unwanted um, uh, engineering loads. So um, we'll hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, so lots to still be learned um, and lots that you're yep. already anticipating could be potential impacts that we need to start um, learning about. Um, let me go to um, Erno Bonebaker asks, what about looking at helix anchors or drilled and grout in harder bottoms? Sure. The, uh, I mean, that, the, I don't think that the um, anchor, the anchor type that is used is going to be a uh, function of it, um, the type of mooring system that it has. Is it going to be a, a horizontal loaded mooring system like a catenary or is it going to have some kind of vertical component? Um, and, and then it also is a function of the soil type and what's down there. So a lot of the um, soils in Maine are bedrock and have to be uh, drilled and grouted. Um, if, it's, um, if it's in sand, it, it can use the, the helical um, anchors are new, but they're, uh, they, they show a lot of promise. So I, I would say that, that those are a, a great option, but it's good to have a, a lot of different options in the, in the quiver to, to be able to um, address any soil type that there is. Great. Um... Dan Slanner asks, understanding that there is currently limited floating technology in operation, um, and this is a great question, did any of these projects that have happened take into account the fisheries interactions and the vessel transiting needs? I mean, what can we be learned from the very few 84 megawatts that are already in the water? That, that's a good question. Um, but, you know, they're mostly single turbine projects with the exception of um, of High Wind 2, which is in Scotland's five turbines. Um, and uh, the um, principal power uh, wind float Atlantic, which just went in last year. So the experience is very limited. Um, in all cases, I would say that they um, had to have interactions with the fishing community to, to at least inform the stakeholders. Um, but I, I don't think that there's been enough data collected to know exactly um, what that would look like. The, the, I think that um, in, in from my personal standpoint, I don't have that that information of what they did collect off of High Wind Two, so I apologize. But we could get. Um, I think they've they've looked at it, and. Uh, and Good question. I think, yep. Yeah. Um, um, thanks for that. And I would add that I know that the state does currently have an agreement with the UK, and has already been in touch with the folks at High Wind Maine, and and are having these conversations yep. about what how can we begin to figure uh, get some lessons learned. Um, on the front end of things. So um, more, to, I think more that we, we could have for an interaction there and an opportunity to learn <laughs> from that project. Um, uh, Rick Wally asks, how does the mooring footprint vary with depth and are moorings of neighboring turbine bases interconnected? Um, so that's a good question. It, they, the, um, there's research being done on shared moorings right now and shared anchor systems. Uh, so that, may uh, come about. Uh, it's mostly to um, for efficiency in the wind farm and to be able to uh, uh, share moorings and, and avoid some of the costs. Um, I th um, the so, so what was the first part of the question it was uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the how does the mooring footprint vary? Vary, yeah. yeah. So so yeah. Uh, 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 the mooring footprint gets larger with depth. Um, so the shallower it is, the, the less the less depth there is. And um, I've I've made um, I, I think it really has to comes down to the detailed design. But uh, on one of my slides, I, I indicated that there was about a four to one uh, mooring line length to water depth um, ratio. So as the um, depth increases, that ratio gets pretty big. Got it. Um, I'm going to take one more question from the chat because I think it's sort of related to this anchoring and then I'll go to um, Paul Anderson who has his hand up. And that's sort of what about suction anchors that have been used in Europe um, and what type of bottom is needed for these? Piece that I asked about. Yeah, the, the suction anchors are, um, are, are used in, uh, 
in uh, they're very, very commonly used to support vertical loads. Um, they have to have the right soil type be, to be able to be used, though. Uh, they have to have a, an embedment depth that's suitable for um, for the, that uplift force. So it depends on the soil, depends on the conditions. Um, some some of the places where there's bedrock, they won't be able to be used. Got it. Thank you yeah. for that, Walt. Um, Paul, we can go to you for your question. Thanks, Laura. Um, thank you, Walt. Um, question, my question is about shoreside infrastructure and what's anticipated to be needed, whether we're talking about the, the smaller research array here in the Gulf of Maine or even something larger. You mentioned the likelihood that these need to be decommissioned and we don't know the lifespan of them quite yet, but you said 25 to 30 years. So the shoreside infrastructure, I assume, is going to be very busy um, moving these things in and out for either repair or for deployment and rotating them. They're not all going to go down at the same time. And um, right. so there's got to be some kind of infrastructure for tending, deployment, decommissioning. And then there's also the, the land-based transportation of these very large things. Any comment about how places are dealing with that around the world? Yeah, they're they're dealing with it um, as they have to. Um, the the port infrastructure, I, I would say, the the none of the ports in the United States uh, can support the development of of offshore wind floating or non floating um, as they are. Most there's a lot of investment going on up and down the coast on uh, different port uh, facilities, um, and there'll be a lot more. Um, as I've said, that the ports have to have the right conditions so that there's a, a, a deep enough draft to tow in and out, they're a wide enough channel. Uh, they have to be able to have enough lay down area and unused uh, support air, uh, facilities to be able to lift and assemble them. So the, the ports that are used to construct the turbines will probably also be used uh, or can also be used to do the service that doesn't mean that we can't have service just service ports or uh, personnel transport for locations where um, the, the ships coming come in and out of but not the turbines um, so there will probably be multiple points where where the, that work occurs and um, and I think that you know it, it, as you said it's a it's not everything's coming in at once so there'll be a um, rotation of, of machines being serviced and and then new machines going out as the industry grows. Thank you for that. Well, um, and I think that's one of the um, port parts behind the roadmap is for the state to actually think about sort of how what would what would this look like and what would what would you need for ports and harbor and infrastructure and um, what are all the implications of that we need to consider. Um, and, I, and I would just things. add um, that, that the con construction of, of a substructure like Aquaventus one and um, would uh, which uses concrete. Um, would probably need a, a, a additional manufacturing facilities near the coast uh, that you wouldn't probably want to transfer these uh, parts over roads. They would be transferred uh, at a seacoast. And um, uh, there would be a, a, a larger requirement because a lot of those jobs would be uh, in Maine rather than imported from Europe as, as a lot of the projects are right now. So we'd be building those, those substructures in in Maine or in a local, lo more local uh, supply chain. Thank you, Walt. Um, Chris McGuire asks, when would the inner array cables likely be mid-water versus on the bottom or buried? That, yeah, I that's know a good that's question. Sort of an ongoing. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we have a number, but it's. Um, I think you know the, the cables in Maine would probably be buried, and they would probably be on the bottom because the depths aren't as great. But when you get out into the west coast, where the depths are a thousand meters, it, it's a lot of extra uh, dollars to uh, bring the cables all the way to the bottom, and then run them along the bottom, and then bring them all the way back up. And and so there there may be a like a a, a mid depth. Um, level where the cables all, all are, are floated. Um, but that hasn't been determined yet. Um, there was a question about what's the 
um, navigation channel draft and width needed to service, um, particularly the NEAV prep platform, but I guess I would say, you know, a floating, semi-submersible floating platform. Yeah, I, I as mean, those for, vessels are going in and out, I guess the, I assume the question's related to that. I, I'm not an expert on, on this, but I think that the, um, the widths need to be greater than 300 meters, uh, 300 feet rather. Um, I, I would say they, um, you know, let's say 400 feet, maybe nominal for, for a channel width. And uh, I'm not sure what the drafts are, um, but, you know, in the uh, 20, 25 meter range, it's not, um, uh, maybe, maybe some, I mean, I'm sure there are the people in the land that know this, the answer to this better than I do, but I, cause I just don't have these numbers memorized, but, sure. um, uh, um, and then cl overhead clearance is a, another big issue. Being able to, to tow these structures in and out fully assembled, they get, they're, they're pretty tall, uh, yeah. six, 700 feet tall. Um, lots to consider with such a large, large structure. And I would note that we are making sure we do collect these questions and the ones that, you know, we feel we want to make sure we follow up on. And um, the, the GEO is keeping a pretty active FAQ. Um, so we might follow up with you, Walt, specifically um, on some sure. of these to make sure we get the, get the right answers. Um, and also make sure we're, we're highlighting questions that still need to get um, answers. Um, there was one question uh, and it wasn't sure if Aaron got it answered, but it was um, um, for any particular uh, 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 derelict fishing gear. Can you speak more about what these systems look like? Is it, are you envisioning, is it AUVs or acoustics? Um, you talked a little bit about ROVs. Is that what you're envisioning this would the, look like? Or is, I, I or think it, 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 I, I don't think we know yet. I think there's, this is an area Right for innovation, um, th there needs to be systems th that can go and clear the, the lines. I think uh, acoustics are used, inclinometers are used, strain gauges are used to to determine if a cable's uh, inclination and uh, and orientation is as it should be. If a if a net or something gets caught on the cable, it will deflect the cable and change its position, and then that. Um, sensors um, may be in place to detect that and to uh, make uh, and to assess the um, the cause of that. And if it's a structural problem or a, or something that's due to um, uh, derelict fishing gear, then that's uh, that's it, it can be determined. And it has to be really something that we can determine uh, from remotely, so we don't have to be inspecting uh, everything all the time. Got it. Um, what sea states are required to service the nacelles when they are floating? Forces involved at the top of the moving lever arm seem significant and potentially hazardous. Yeah, the the it's it. I think the um, the, the the most the metric that I've I'm most familiar with is the uh, um, sea state for uh, personnel transfer, and um, the standard ship is in two meter seas, but um, the, they're working on uh, transfer vessels that can go to three meters. And, and if you can get on the on the substructure, if you can get on the, the turbine, then then it's OK to be out there and, and servicing it. So it's, it's um, stable enough for. Yeah. And if, if they're doing oper uh, crane operations um, next to it, then there, there may be uh, a, a tighter criteria for uh, what you can do in, in certain winds. Uh, for example, you can't remove a blade if it's really windy. Uh, it has to be more calm so, so you don't catch catch the wind and um, risk um, the wind taking the blade away. Got it. Um, Paul, you still have your hand on uh, hand up. Did you have another question? Paul Anderson? No, I'm sorry. That's I okay. I just wanted to, I want to double check and make sure. Um, I, I, I have a question for you, um, Walt, and then I think we've got one, one more question that you may or may not be able to answer about um, the Atlantic link cable. But um, w with your presentation, you know, it seems like we're, I don't know, a decade behind where we were with our, in terms of fixed platform um, versus what we're just beginning to realize about floating and, and these are and all the questions that come with this different technology. When you think about um, the states 
research array concept um, and the opportunity to put a few more than just one or two um, uh, up to, I guess, 12 in the water. What, from your perspective, like what, what are the kind of research questions that you have that you would hope could be explored with this um, potential opportunity for a research array? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, I, th I think we've been talking about the fishing community and I think that's um, one of the, the big factors that we might look at. Um, we, we need to look at uh, the reliability of the systems um, that, that are being put in, um, knowing that for the most part, these will be new turbines that won't have a lot of operating experience elsewhere. I mean, they, they will have operating experience throughout the industry, but they'll be new uh, in terms of their, you know, when, when they've been developed. Um, I think a lot of the um, processes that we've been talking about, just all of this is, a lot of it is theoretical and a lot of it is, um, you know, planned, uh, but not validated uh, design research and uh, and the implementation of that really done at that scale at the say the 100 megawatt scale is is the right step for for Maine to take I think because it 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 allows you to look at this at the at a smaller scale than than what um, an investor for a for a five or thousand megawatt project would would have to um, commit to so it's a it's a great uh, step it's it's a bigger step than what anybody's done so far so um, so it's it's right where where I think you need to be. Great, um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with this project, um, and we can certainly get the answer to it um, and and send it back. Um, but John, uh, we have a question that: What's the status of the Atlantic Link cable from New Brunswick to Plymouth, Mass? Are you familiar with that project or or not? I don't know if that's something in your bailiwick. I, I've heard of it. I don't I don't have any idea what the status of that is though. Um, okay. Generally, subsea transmission is is um, would if if you could build it, it would it would really uh, strengthen the, the the grid and uh, and give you a lot more options on on renewable energy uh, scenarios. Yeah. Uh, and as I mentioned, and I think it's uh, further up, and we can post it again, that there is quite an active um, three series conversation about transmission and offshore transmission um, and. I suspect there's some good information that might help answer that question, but we can also reach out um, to the person who asked the question and try to see if we can help get an answer. Um, I am, and Stephanie, thank you, just put it up. Um, I, I am looking for any, uh, we're getting close to our 1115. I also wanted to again mention for anyone who came in late that we, um, were, we decided that we had such a rich conversation here um, to happen around floating offshore wind technology. We would stick to this conversation and have another conversation around cabling um, equally as rich with a lot of good questions. Um, so stay tuned for that. We'll let everyone know about that um, and uh, per continue to provide references um, and continue to try to um, answer some of these questions. Um, I have one, I see one more question for from Tom. Um, and I would also, uh, so let me get one more question from Tom and, um, and then I think we'll wrap up if no one else wants to put anything in the chat or raise their hand. So Tom Klo, would you have a question for us, for Walt? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I asked a prior question on servicing the nacelles um, mm -hmm. in sea states. I'm a mariner and have worked on research vessels as well as sail training ships. And I've experienced working at the top of masts. Um, I'm wondering what human um, sort of biological needs are taken in place or are taken up when, when you're designing this. Because in my experience, working at the top of a mast, you're, you're going to get seasick, particularly if you've been on shore and then you show up and you get inside a closed box that's hundreds of feet above the ground and just from an employment perspective to find people who are interested in dealing with this as well as doing quality work uh, I feel like is a challenge what what's uh, what are you what are you going to do if somebody gets seasick up there I, I, I don't know if you wanted to take that well if that because I know you you do research around these but I'm not sure if you've been involved in the in the development um, well, well what I the, what I would say is that um, 
these platforms are uh, that you shouldn't compare them to a sailboat or or a, the the, um, the platforms are designed to be very stable in waves and to not move. We um, we go um, to great lengths to d design the hydrodynamics so that the platforms are um, the so that the waves ride through the platforms and don't in induce additional accelerations at the nacelle level. So I would expect there to be very little motion at the top. Okay, as, um, so if, if there's, if you've got a calm day, but you've got a long period swell running from a distant storm, they're still gonna be stable. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's the that's the, the idea. And and the um, it, they have to be in order to uh, not fatigue the, uh, the turbine parts. Um, and sure. uh, you know, it, are they the same stability as a fixed foundation to the seabed? Probably not. There's there's going to be a little bit of ex additional motion, maybe, but it's not going to be anywhere comparable to a, a sailboat that's that's rocking and um, and has um, those other degrees of freedom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. And sure. then we've got one last question, um, and. Uh, it's regarding the status on research on underwater noise uh, generated by the different designs um, and its effects on marine critters. Um, I don't know if you can speak to that. I also know, um, Stephanie, I don't know if you could put in there, there's a website that has, uh, is it Typhus? I can never pronounce it correctly. That has much of the impact related uh, research that's been done um, and that might be useful as a, as a reference as well. But can you answer that question well? Do you have a sense uh, the, of uh, the underwater? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, underwater noise um, by the different designs. Yeah, so so the only um, we we don't we haven't made any measurements like that. Um, there might be measurements. I, I don't expect there to be a a, a big uh, noise issue, um, but the noise would be generated by vibrations from the turbine transmitted down the steel tower, and then uh, and then into the water column. Uh, I I don't think that those so, I'm sure that those sounds will be audible, but it will, um, relative to other um, types of uh, marine machines like like boats and ships, uh, they would probably be much smaller. Um, something that we would probably put on the uh, research lease agenda to um, to measure. Great, um, and we can certainly follow up, um, Pat, if there are other references we can find for you. All right. Um, I really appreciate, uh, Walt, you giving us such a thorough presentation and um, being on the hot seat for a lot of Q&A, um, some of which within your wheelhouse and some of which I know you were stretching yeah. a little bit. So really do appreciate um, you uh, addressing some of these important questions as we all begin to learn about um, uh, offshore wind and how that might impact us in the Gulf of Maine and what floating technologies are around, around and what we need to consider and what opportunities it presents as well. So um, really, really great. I'm gonna turn it back to Selena um, to let us uh, wrap up. And I would note again, we'll keep you all um, abreast of future webinars as we start to put them into, into place and welcome ideas and suggestions for topics that we should dig into um, to be able to have um, learning in the Gulf of Maine around these important questions and issues. So Selena. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Walt. That was a really interesting conversation and a lot of helpful information. And I'll just echo what Laura said. We are working on trying to uh, educate ourselves and provide um, as much information as we can to everyone who is interested about offshore wind and the work we're doing. I'll ask Stephanie to put our, if she hasn't, I think she has our website where you can find additional information about our efforts. And, and as Laura said, we really welcome your feedback in terms of what would be helpful for you to hear about. We were holding a, a series of webinars and want to gear, um, organize those to, to meet the um, kind of areas of interest and, and interest that you have. So don't hesitate to be in touch and we appreciate your, your participation in this and our work going forward. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Take care everybody and have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.